Well, I warned you, these are going to start getting weird. Before we begin, thank you very much to the Lost Double Clutch Plastic Addict episode for joining the Patreon campaign. Thank you very much for pitching in. There's a few people who figured out that if they just pitch in a buck or two, they can basically get me to say anything on stream as long as I find it appropriate for the channel. Uh, and there's a few people who had fun with that. And you know, even if that's what it is, you jump in, you drop your two bucks, and you drop out just to hear me say something silly. It all supports the channel, it all keeps it going, it all keeps the daily content coming, so thank you very much for doing it, uh, and I hope you had fun making me, uh, making me remember that, yes, that is still somewhere in the queue. Um, uh, yeah, I need to dig out Double Clutch and figure out what I was gonna do with that video, you know, five years ago. So... There's a topic that's been buzzing around Transformers recently, and it all kind of comes from the press circuit going on for the new live-action movie. So this popped up. Uh, this popped up late yesterday. So TFW had it up at like midnight uh, this morning. Uh, so this is with uh, uh, Stephen Capel Jr., who is the director for the movie. And there's a quote in here that has gotten a lot of people worked up and a lot of people starting to throw a lot of questions and debates around. Uh, the quote has to do with uh, the fact that uh, where the movie falls as far as continuity goes. And according to the quote, if I'm reading it correctly, it doesn't mess up any of the timeline in 2006-2007. We're actually going in a direction that allows us to protect that side of the universe. And a lot of people cry foul over this. Now, now, don't get me wrong. There's some people who are thrilled to hear that because they love the original Bayverse and they really want to see it continue. However, there's a lot of people going, are you kidding me? Then that's literally impossible. And if you can't tell by the title of this video, I think it is rather impossible as well. I don't think there's any way to do a movie set previous to 2007 that actually protects the events of 2007 especially in the direction they seem to be going now i could be wrong about said direction we won't know until the movie comes out but as it stands at face value yes it seems impossible for the 2007 movie and rise of the beast to coexist in the same canon Okay, not entirely true. I will admit the title's a little bit clickbaity. There are ways, because of course, in writing, you're limited literally only by what you can imagine. And there is crazy things you can imagine in order to make all of that work. But a lot of it is going to revolve around crazy, like time travel, memory wiping, all this in order to make 2007's movie make some kind of sense. There's another way to... We'll get to that toward the end of the video. For now, I wanted to take a look back, uh, just so we know. So, the big thing that makes people cry foul is the fact that we're going to revolve this movie around the oncoming threat of Unicron. Now, in the last night, we found out that Unicron is actually the core of Earth, a plot point ripped straight from Transformers Prime. Okay? So, Unicron is now on his way in this movie. Now, this movie's set in the 90s, but how do you get Unicron into the core of an entire planet and then have him, like, regrow and start sprouting horns out of the surface of the Earth if he's on his way now? And we know that he is, like, he's not, like, a metaphysical thing. We know, and he's not, like, a, like, a, a looming, like, entity thing that's going to take over earth and possess it and that's what we're throwing no because we literally see unicron unicron is in like scourge is in unicron's presence according to the trailer and unicron is literally looking at him it's a physical thing so it's not a metaphysical thing that could take over and like possess the earth and that's how he becomes unicron uh that's not the thing now uh even the like remember even the whole like there's a, there's a lot there's a lot here that like you can conjecture whatever you want you can headcanon whatever you want but right now that's the face of it unless this new trilogy of movies actually does a lot of explaining and a lot of weird stuff that's just how it goes 
Like, how do we get from that to this without just like destroying the earth and recompiling it? No, there's things that have done that. There's things in Transformers that have done that. One of the, the weird G.I. Joe Transformer crossover kind of did that. Like I said, it's never impossible in fiction because it's all about what you can do within the universe's rules. And we know the live action universe plays loose and fast with its rules, so we're not really all that concerned. Maybe it'll work, but largely I don't think it will. Now, for those kind of getting fired up over continuity, canon, uh, let's, let's be clear here. The movies have never had good canon. Right, the canonical state of anything in the movie is constantly in flux and it's never solid. It's never set in stone. So let's just look back here. Let's look back. Let's look back here at some of the previous, some of my favorite continuity gaps. It's hardly all of them. Hardly all of them. But these are just the ones that I like the best, then the ones that we can goof off on a little bit. So for instance, when did Bumblebee land on Earth? Because in the Bumblebee movie, he lands in the 80s, right? And that's when he meets Charlie and they have the best live-action Transformers movie. But in The Last Night, we find out that he was in there in World War II fighting Nazis. So when exactly did Bumblebee land? Um, now, maybe the Bumblebee movie isn't fair because its continuity is kind of weird as well. We'll talk about that here in a bit, don't worry. Uh, that kind of falls under the same, like umbrella of like what uh the producer for the movies bonaventura has been talking about when he does the press circuits uh he really doesn't seem like he knows what he's talking about when he talked about the bumblebee movie uh which by the way when did optimus prime land since we're going into this did he land in the 80s after the bumblebee movie or did he land in 2007 as long as we're getting like the bumblebee continuity out of the way during interviews, Bonaventura would talk about the Bumblebee movie as if it was a prequel, as if it was a reboot, and if it as as if it was just a spin-off. He did he famously said he didn't like the phrase reboot, and then he kind of described it as a reboot, but he also made it sound like it was a prequel to the 07 movie, even though the events of the movie contradict what happened in the 07 movie. And you know, we we know for a fact that like there's like, there's elements there that are supposed to retain the 2007's ca canon, the absence of Megatron, the Camaro mode at the end of the movie, but there's also the landing of Optimus Prime and a whole bunch of other stuff that just doesn't make sense if you try to make it part of the canon. So that movie's iffy, all right? So that movie's iffy. Let's take that movie out for now. We'll focus just on the Michael Bay movie, since that's the canon that we're so concerned about today. So... Megatron in Transformers 4, uh, Age of Extinction. Uh, it is rebuilt into Galvatron, which means his body is now composed of Transformium, which means he doesn't transform by physically moving his parts around. He transforms by breaking up into billions of nanomachines as like a cloud of microbots that kind of swarm back together into one mode or the other. In The Last Night, Megatron reappears and has a completely new body that is a completely normal Transformer. No Transformium elements whatsoever, which would have let him like regenerate damage, would have let him transform instantly and fly around as a cloud. None of that happened, and there's no explanation as to what happened in between those two. While we're talking about The Last Night... Let's talk about Lennox and the fact that Lennox was brought in to listen to a recording to confirm whether or not that they heard the voice of Megatron. We're going to forget the part where it, they switched to Frank Welker's voice uh, after the third movie. Ju we're just going to put that a little side aside because that's a casting thing. So the actors, the characters have to play along with that. I'm focused more on the fact that Lennox never had the chance to hear Megatron's voice. So Megatron barely appears during the fight in the third movie, so we can take that scene out completely. The only times that they were involved in the same battle consistently was the first and second movie. The first movie, they shared no scenes whatsoever, and the second movie, they shared no scenes whatsoever. The only time that he may, may have heard Megatron's voice was during the battle in Egypt, but when Megatron screamed out to Devastator. That's literally it, and that's assuming he could hear it over the literal war going on around him. 
I find that very hard to believe that he ever heard Megatron's voice, especially enough to identify it from a recording. How about Bumblebee's voice? Because that was a whole thing. Because the, the gimmick of live-action Bumblebee is he talks out at the radio, right? Okay. Uh, at the end of the first movie, it's fixed. Uh, he just suddenly starts speaking as if, like, his repair systems finally got it working. Which is ironic, considering his repair systems should have been worried about his missing legs at the time. But no, Bumblebee spoke with his true voice to Optimus Prime. Then in movie, then he proceeded to talk in, out the radio for the next three movies. And they just, they kind of played it off as just like, well, he prefers that. Oh, now he's just playing around. Uh, but still, he never spoke in his normal voice until the climactic scene in The Last Night, where he tries to speak to Optimus Prime, which, which again, remember, The Last Night had this whole thing where, like, he was, like, going through, like, trying to replace his voice box and trying to fix it again, which means the repairs from the first movie apparently just died again, uh, and then it just magically starts working at the end, uh, you know, of the end of the fight with Nemesis Prime to shake him back into being Optimus Prime, and Prime mentions that he hasn't heard Bumblebee's true voice since they left Cybertron. No! No, you heard it a few years ago on Earth! Yeah. Little things like that. Little things like that bother me. Uh, how about this? What is the matrix of leadership in this universe? Please tell me what it is, because... From what I know, in uh, in Revenge of the Fallen, it's just the key for the Sun Harvester. I mean, that's all it is. I mean, there's no like sense of leadership behind it. It's not some ancient token that take that contains the knowledge and wisdom of all leaders prior. It doesn't have any of that gravitas to it. You know, like it somehow connects to the original Primes uh, because it's their artifact mostly, uh, but. It doesn't really have that kind of significance to it. For all intents and purposes, it's just a key. You know, it might as well be the key to my car. And I hand it to someone and say, hey, you're the leader now. Have this, have my car keys. You're leader now. We jump forward one movie to Dark of the Moon and Megatron or er, er, Optimus Prime is now treating the Matrix of Leadership as if it was the legitimate original Matrix, where he's trying to hand it back to Sentinel Prime, as if this is a token of passing leadership back to his mentor. Sentinel Prime probably wasn't even built by the time the Matrix of Leadership was lost by the Ancient Primes and the Fallen, so why is he giving this Matrix back? It has no significance to Sentinel whatsoever. It's not a... Er, no, it's not, there's no timeline where it makes sense for Sentinel to have held it. Ugh. Ugh. How about the planet Cybertron? How about the planet Cybertron? So, in the first movie, it looks just like this really weird, twisted, metallic planet. It looks like a scene from a Doom game is what it looks like. But it's just a like gigantic, metallic city planet, okay? When we see it in Dark of the Moon, it's... Number one, it's gigantic. Of course it is. It's Cybertron. Uh, but also... The whole surface of the planet seems to be made of weird hexagons, like it's one gigantic honeycomb, which, you know, if you kind of follow the way Hasbro thinks of Bumblebee these days, that's kind of a nice allegory. But when we see it again in The Last Night, it is not only significantly smaller and far, I mean, it's significantly smaller and very different in design. You can, I mean, uh, you can retcon that. Now, there's headcanon and there's conjecture that says, well, after its, you know, supposed destruction uh, at the end of Dark of the Moon, this is what's left of the planet trying to rebuild itself. But there's nothing that actually says that. There's no, there's nothing in the actual live action movies that actually confirms that. It's just what we have to put together in order to make the canon make sense. Uh, and even taking that out, out, the planet Cybertron from movie one to movie three looks nothing alike. So. Cybertron just radically different in size and shape across three different movies. No one ever mentions it. No one ever brings it up. Uh, what about Starscream's head? So Starscream had his head exploded at the end of Dar Dark of the Moon uh, by Bumblebee and Sam, but Megatron picks it up to do a little soliloquy in the last night as if it's uh, perfectly fine. It's completely intact somehow and in a scrapyard. Like, so someone... 
someone put Starscream's head back together and then threw it away in a scrapyard. Okay? Really? Did Cade do it? Did was Cade just bored so he's rebuilding Decepticons? I don't know. This is the kind of thing. This is where I'm ending. Like, I'm putting it off there. These are just a few. These are just a few massive continuity gaps. So if you're if you're going to start debating the continuity of the Michael Bay movies compared to Rise of the Beast, remember even the Bay movies are not canonical to the Bay movies. Every single movie just seems to forget what happened in the last one and just do whatever it wants. And if there's gaps in it, who cares? We're just making a movie to sell tickets and toys. You know, it is very much the attitude of the original, you know, 1980s cartoon. We're just doing it to sell stuff. Doesn't matter if the story makes sense. Just throw a story out there. Whatever. We're going to make a billion dollars on it no matter what schlock we put on the screen. Just make it. Who cares? And that just feels like the attitude behind it. And of course nothing's going to make sense. Now, as far as Dark of the Moon, and as far as uh, Rise of the Beast go, and how do you connect it to the 2007 movie? Like I said, there are ways. Um, you're not going to like it. You're not going to like it. The only way I come, it occurs to me that this could possibly work, and that the t events of the 2007 movie could still occur, even though all of this is set previous to that and seems to super vent or like uh, supersede a lot of the events of 2007. Multiverse. This is literally it, people. Without massive amounts of time travel nonsense to get Unicron in Earth's position, you know, billions of years in the past before Earth had even formed into a ball, uh, in order to make sense of uh, Optimus Prime, like Optimus Prime would, like Optimus Prime would have to like handle Unicron on Earth have his memory, have all Transformers memories wiped, and then leave the planet, except for Bumblebee, and then everyone have to come back down in 2007, which makes no sense whatsoever. The only way this works is if this is a separate multiverse, and we're actually interjecting uh, the 2007 movie into it. There is a theory out there that Scourge is actually a reformatted Optimus Prime from a different universe. Now this would also now, now this would kind of explain the alt mode for starters, but it would also kind of make sense because he is a minion of Unicron, and this is what Unicron does. He reformats Transformers to do his bidding. So maybe, just maybe, we might be looking at a new form of the 2007 Optimus Prime, redone as a Terracon Scourge, thanks to Unicron's influence. Far far-fetched theory i know but take a look at this this is what ha this is what you ended on this is the like as far as what canon we can actually glue together this is the last scene of the bayverse it is what's left of planet cybertron physically colliding with planet earth now you imagine this situation this situation that our heroes are in and what do you have it's not just the damage being done by the contact of Cybertron onto Earth. That's already catastrophic damage. You know, you're talking entire countries wiped out. However, let's take a look at the more scientific side of this. You've got this gigantic ball. It's way bigger than the moon. And let's, let's remember, the moon is already carrying enough gravity on its own to affect the tides here on Earth. So now you have a bigger object even closer to Earth than the moon is, bigger and denser. It's metal instead of stone. It is way denser than the moon. So now you've got massive tidal waves, potential tectonic plate shifts, which means massive earthquakes. You've got the gravity of Cybertron affecting our atmosphere, because now because we need gravity is kind of why we have like an atmosphere and oxygen staying close to the Earth. So now that's going away. Now that's going. Now that's affected. Uh, you're looking at Armageddon. You're looking at the apocalypse going on right now. There is no scenario here where Earth is not catastrophically destroyed. Even being this close to Cybertron, with as dense as it is, with as much gravitational pull as it would have, 
you're also talking about Earth being pulled out of its natural orbit. So now you're talking about planetary freeze, you know? When you break down the science of it, not that the movie makers or the writers would ever break down science and bring science into their science fiction movie, you're talking about catastrophic, irreparable damage that is already underway. There is no, no one at the end of the movie goes, hey guys, where's the reverse gear on Cybertron? How do we back this up? No one says a word about it. So, yeah. If you're here, you're facing a Unicron in the surface of the Earth that's awakening, a, a Cybertron in orbit that no one really has the power to move, so we gotta, and no one really can get rid of it, catastrophic effects to the planet Earth itself, and Optimus Prime just there, watching it all burn. So yeah, if, an op if that Optimus Prime can be corrupted into Nemesis by just a bit of Quintesson reprogramming, then what happens when Unicron awakens to reformat him? What happens? I feel like that's the only way this would work out. You know, if the 2007 movie's continuity is protected by continuing it to this natural conclusion, the destruction of Earth, the failure of Optimus Prime, his reformatting into Scourge, and Unicron uh, crossing dimensions to destroy a different continuity so that's all i can really think of really if, if there is a way for these movies to work out it's got to be some kind of multiverse nonsense there's really no way to piece them together in order to make any kind of sense even amongst the uh, bay movies themselves bumblebee notwithstanding whatever this movie does we're notwithstanding just keep in mind if you're going to get into a debate over continuity over this movie just remember it's always been a mess it's going to be an irreparable mess, and just don't get too heavy into it. Just, you know, have your debate, try to have fun, and try to just let people have their opinions, because everyone's going to have a different one until these, until basically this whole trilogy of, is done. We're not going to know who exactly is right or wrong. So, keep it civil, try to keep the content, in, try to keep the discussion engaging, try to be receptive to other people's uh, ideas about if all this works out or not. This is just my opinion after all. So, yeah, just be nice about it. And we'll all see who is right together. But for now, yeah, I don't see how these continuities mesh. I just don't see it. But that's for us to figure out. For today, thank you for joining me. I hope you got a little bit of, uh, a little bit of something off of this breakdown of Michael Bay and now Bonaventura's continuity. Uh, it's It exists somehow. I don't know how, but it does. But nevertheless, thank you guys for watching, and I will see you next time. Uh, it's the bosun's turn. <laughs> he's looking at TJ's character, and he's just like, what you gonna do? Right. I blow him a kiss. <laughs> I love him. <laughs> I love him. What's your problem? <laughs> he's just gonna pull his can crossbow and just fire at you. That's fair at this point. <laughs> <laughs>